At 10.23 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, a 9.6 earthquake struck the downtown area. Extensive damage and heavy loss of life has been reported. Several aftershocks are expected to occur for the next several hours. Oh my god, we're having an earthquake. Wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. Can you feel that? Okay, this is interesting. There go the lights. Oh. We are starting the evacuation of the entire facility at this time. Copy and acknowledged. Center, what are you reporting? Uh, we want to know where the um, shelters are. In I don't have any information regarding shelters. Do you need any emergency help? No. Okay, I can't assist you any further. They don't know. Bye. -bye. Emergency center, what are you reporting? Um, regarding the earthquake, I'm wondering... Uh, uh, do you need police, fire, ambulance, sir? Excuse me? Do you need a police department, the fire department, or an ambulance? I don't need either. Okay, I can't assist you any further on this line. Goodbye. Have you heard about the uh, 9.0 scale earthquake that's supposed to Portland called the big one? Yes. Heard of it, yeah. Heard of it, yes. Oh, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that uh, will not be too fun. No. Yes. Not aware at all. <laughs> I have. If it does break, it's going to be a big one, and it will affect everybody here in the city. Um, I was aware that there's a, a like a three to 500-year different gap between major earthquakes. More mainstream media has latched on to it recently, so I think it's cause kind of a fervor. I've heard the news on it, yeah. I've heard in the news recently. It sounds terrifying. I have heard reports. I think there was an article that appeared in the New Yorker not too long ago. Do you consider yourself prepared for an earthquake at this moment? Sure. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? No. I am totally unprepared. I haven't done anything. I, I haven't. No, I'm not prepared. Just that simple. Neither am I. Not right at this moment. Not, uh, not as much as I should be, no. Moderately, moderately prepared. No. Fairly well, yeah. Um, well, I don't think anyone's really prepared for this unless you're like a Boy Scout or someone who's like super paranoid about earthquakes. Absolutely, I've been pretty well experienced with earthquakes. I was in Alaska and got hit with an earthquake once. I was asleep. And all of a sudden, my house went out from under me. I was on a futon on the floor, and all of a sudden, the house came up and slapped me in the face. That was kind of interesting. And it was quite scary. The entire ground was just rolling. Yeah, the windows were rocking back and forth. 25th of um, April, um, I was in Nepal, in Pokhara, and it was 80 kilometers from the epicenter of the earthquake. I was in my hotel room, which was on the first floor of a, I think it was a three-story building, and I just felt this vibration starting and um, the, like the building rattling, and I thought, holy heck, this is not, you know, machinery, and I sort of ran down the stairs <clears throat> and uh, got outside as quick as I could, um, and I went out onto the road, which is like a solid road, and it was just undulating. It was just like the most surreal thing that I've ever had with that, and there's a lot of people screaming, running outside in the buildings and stuff, and. Um, and stuff. So I mean, it was pretty scary, and I stayed there for um, you know I just got involved with aid work after that. But there was a big earthquake a couple of days later. Um, I was paragliding over there in my spare time, and there was an earthquake as I before I launched off the top of the mountain. Another one as soon as I landed on the ground again. And I thought, man, this is just terrible, you know. Decided right then I did never want to be in another one. <laughs> well, what's one thing that you've been taught that really sticks out to you that you should do in the event of an earthquake? Just stay away from things that might fall down. Get in a doorway or get under a table or get in the bathtub. Right. Get Those in a the bathtub. I remember. Maybe grab a mattress and take it and throw it on top of you. Mm -hmm. Are you worried? Um, not that it impacts my day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I'm a little worried. Um, well, I think about it, but I don't think I worry about it. Yeah, I'm a little worried just because, like, we have no idea what to do during a huge earthquake. So have you considered preparing for an earthquake? I wouldn't even know where to start. <laughs> Probably like most people, yes, I've considered it, and I'm a little on the lazy side, I guess. <laughs> and so it's one of those things that you talk about when you're with other people, you're like, you know, I really should get a disaster kit or something prepared, and then you don't follow up on it. I was in California, and they said California is going to fall into the ocean. 
So I went down and sat on the beach and waited, and it didn't happen. But there was a little old lady sitting next to me, and uh, she looked at me and she said, Seagulls won't eat bacon. That's a true story, too. How did you get involved in this field? Uh, you know what, I'll say this. Uh, I don't know that I sought this field out as much uh, 25 and 30 years ago. I don't even know that 30 years ago I knew that this was a field. Uh, but sometime after I had graduated college, uh, I found myself going from uh, emergency to emergency with a contract that I was working on uh, with the Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, I think I kind of fell in love with it and wanted to get a little bit more on the policy side and ended up uh, uh, working for a local emergency management agency. The first thing that we're trying to do is uh, make sure that uh, the public understands the type of position that uh, government businesses and, and a lot of the services they are used to, um, what type of condition they may be in. Because uh, it's likely that uh, electricity will be out for quite a while, weeks if not months. Uh, water will be impacted for quite a long time. So uh, when you roll up all of these things, I think one of those difficulties is really about expectation. Uh, if the people prepare, we'll be in better shape um, to sort of weather those first couple days and weeks. Um, but if the community uh, is not well prepared and uh, relies on government for all of those aspects, uh, I think that at the end of the day it makes it more difficult because government will have to prioritize some of those things that, that they do. We just can't be everywhere at, at, at all times. And so for me the toughest part is the expectation, meeting the expectation of the community and having them aware of what they need to do. Uh, what buildings or bridges do you know of that need to be retrofitted for earthquakes? Uh, you know, there's been um, a few cycles uh, where we've improved building codes. And uh, back in the 70s, um, you know, there was sort of a shift in what Oregon did. And so we started to see uh, buildings and bridges and roads and everything be uh, built with new standards. And uh, those standards improved throughout sort of the 80s and 90s. And uh, so now I could say this. Um, a lot of those older bridges uh, that haven't had a lot of major work done, uh, you know, since the 70s, um, they will be more of a risk than uh, some of the, the newer things that we've seen built around uh, the Portland area in the, certainly in the last decade or so. Uh, one of those other concerns when you talk about bridges is, um, uh, you know, older bridges with very large counterweights, um, you know, that's another big concern too, because if you think about construction, you know, 50 years ago or 75 years ago. Uh, from an engineering standpoint, they were thinking about all of that weight being sort of, you know, pushing downward on a bridge and not quite the lateral forces that we would likely see for uh, uh, minutes with a very, very large earthquake. How is the Red Cross preparing for possible upcoming earthquakes in Portland? Well, a large part of my job is to share education with our community. And so that's something that we've been doing for a long time now and something that we will definitely continue to do. We teach classes um, for community groups. We teach classes in schools, at businesses, other nonprofits, talking to people about what the earthquake risk here is and about the steps that they need to take to become better prepared. So knowing the hazards, making a plan with your family about what you're going to do, and then also starting to build your emergency kit. Um, and how quickly after an earthquake would citizens most likely be able to receive aid? That again is very hard to predict because it's based on the severity of the earthquake. I think in general the city and the state are moving towards recommending that people have at a very minimum 72 hours worth of supplies in their home. Um, but really if it's a very severe event it could be a much longer time until aid is available to you know, our average everyday people in the street. So. The more supplies you can have on hand, I would say would definitely be better. How does the Red Cross determine where to go first to provide uh, relief support? So the Red Cross's role in a large earthquake event is to provide mass care. That means sheltering, um, providing food, and you know starting on that recovery process with people. So the places that we would identify um, are general shelter facilities. So we have agreements with different churches, different schools, large basically anybody with a large meeting hall or place that we could use to potentially set up a shelter. We have those agreements in place ahead of time. And that means that after an earthquake does happen, it would take some time to evaluate where the best place will be to set up a shelter. So what's, what's a safe building still? Um, what will be accessible to people? And what's closest to the communities that are most in need? And so you know, we can't say you know, this one place is gonna be where we're gonna have our shelter. But that's why we do so much work ahead of time to have those places available. That way we can say, oh, this particular neighborhood 
you know, really needs us here and this is our shelter facility in this area. And so that would be one of our more likely places. In Oregon, we never thought of ourselves as earthquake country. We are in the North American crust. We are moving at four and a half centimeters in a westerly direction. Uh, and then off of the coast, we have got a subduction zone, the Juan de Fuca plate that is being subducted underneath us. Uh, and it's moving just about that same rate, about as fast as your fingernail. The big one that we talk about, the 9.0 and above, where the two plates are locked and going underneath it, when it breaks, it will break all the way from Northern California all the way to Vancouver, BC. When that happens, it will knock everybody to the ground and it will last two to three minutes. And so it will just keep going on and on and on. Uh, and there will be a lot of destruction of a lot of the buildings that we have got. That's the big one that we are concerned about, but we also have to be concerned about the, the smaller earthquakes that we have here in this area. So the Cascades are a result of the subduction of this Juan de Fuca plate underneath. It goes down, melts, come back to the surface. And so basically from the crest of the Cascades to the coast is going to be the greatest amount of shaking that you have got. So can you explain the difference between a six and a nine point magnitude earthquake on the Richter scale? Yeah, and so the Richter scale, we don't use the name Richter anymore. We just call them, uh, it's actually the moment magnitude. We just call it the magnitude, but it's a logarithmic scale uh, with a fudge factor thrown in. And so when you go from a six to a seven, uh, the seven generates 30 times the energy of a six. And then when you go from a seven to an eight, that's 30. But then from a six to an eight, that's 30 times 30 or 900. And when you go up to a nine, that's 30 times 30 times 30, which is 27,000 times the amount of energy that is liberated. That is a huge amount of energy uh, that comes from that. Okay, so in your opinion, where are the worst places to be in an earthquake? Worst, uh, worst places to be uh, inside a house or in, inside any type of building, number one. Uh, and so therefore what we tell people is if you are in a house or a building when an earthquake occurs, you duck, cover, and hold. You get underneath something because most of the, uh, the injuries that occur during earthquakes are caused by things falling on people. So uh, if there are students in schools, you get underneath your desk and you hold on to the desk because the desk is going to be bouncing around. Uh, wh wherever you are, try and get underneath uh, something uh, in. You, you stay in the structure until the earthquake stops, then you get out of the building. Uh, and then once you're out of the building, you get away from the building and you get away from trees and any power lines and anything that can uh, come down to you. So the worst places are gonna be in um, those uh, buildings. Uh, the worst buildings that you can have are gonna be unreinfa unreinforced masonry, i.e. brick buildings, because they don't bend uh, as much. Uh, many of our homes are wood and they will bend uh, with the earthquakes and that's really good for uh, earthquake, you know, a good place to be for a building. Um, other places that you have to worry about are uh, underneath power lines, uh, very, very close to glass, uh, windows and stuff like that. You want to get away from the glass windows because many of those will break. The safest places obviously are outside, uh, away from buildings, away from trees. Uh, those are going to be the, the best places and away from water. What a prepper is, is some, in my opinion, is somebody who has taken emergency preparedness or preparedness simply to a higher level of consciousness mm -hmm. or maybe uh, uh, it takes up more of their lifestyle mm -hmm. than the general public does. Do you consider yourself prepared for the big one and how so? That really um, is, is a matter of degrees, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you, if you have a gallon of water uh, in your basement or un, uh, in, under your bed or whatever. I mean, you're prepared to a certain level, right? <laughs> Bruce Lee has a quote where he said, the best way to take a punch is to not be there oh. when it lands, right? Yeah. So the ultimate preparation for the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake would be to move to Oklahoma. Move to Oklahoma. But I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. I love the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be here. Yeah. So am I prepared for it? Yes. Do I continue to get more prepared for it? Yes. So a bug out bag is some sort of carrying container or vessel or backpack that will get you to your bug out location. So if there's a fire in our house, if our house is uninhabitable due to an earthquake or something like that, and we have to leave, that's what a bug out bag is. But I also think that there's an important distinction to be made too about other bags. And so that might be um, EDC, which is everyday carry which is things that I have in my pockets, like right now, like I have a flashlight, I carry a flashlight with me all the time. I usually have, I always have a pocket knife, 
my cell phone with smartphones nowadays, um, knowledge weighs nothing, and there's an incredible amount of knowledge that we can have on our phones yeah. on, on how to do things. My bug out bag uh, is fairly large, and so that's what this is. A vessel to boil water is really important. There's a rule of threes that's out there that says things like you can live three minutes without air, you can live three days without water, you can live three weeks without food. And so the ability to boil water is very important, especially when you consider the Willamette might be the source of our water. So, um, like I said, first aid is really important. And um, I carry some things in this kit, as well as some other things that I would grab in case I was going out the door that I am not necessarily trained in. However, I carry them anyway, because it's possible that if, if I run across a situation in which there's a doctor or a nurse that does know how to use it. I've got it available. A snivel gear are things that I just like. They just make me feel comfortable. I like having hot chocolate at night or whatever. So inside some of this kit, I have hot chocolate. In an emergency situation, we're stressed. It's a critical stress environment. You know, we're going to be on edge. We're going to be emotional. So anything that brings us a little comfort, that's what we need. Again, the subjective application of, of your lifestyle in that emergency situation. Stop, Jeff! <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> 